Well, most football players never play in the Super Bowl, as you know. The same is true for other occupations that have their version of the Super Bowl. For lawyers, the Supreme Court of the United States is the Super Bowl. Everyone in law school reading those Supreme Court cases dreams of the day when they will stand before the Supreme Court of the United States arguing a case. Winning would be the ultimate dream, but just making it to that version of the Super Bowl separates you from more than 99% of lawyers who will never come close to presenting a case to the United States Supreme Court. Neil Katyal, who will join us tonight, has argued 50 cases to the United States Supreme Court, 50. That means, as I just said, Neil Katyal has written more Supreme Court briefs than I have read. And so I am more than eager to hear Neil Katyal's assessment of the briefs that have been submitted so far in the case of Donald J. Trump versus Norma Anderson et al. That is the name of the case that the Supreme Court will hear next Thursday, with Donald Trump appealing a decision by the Supreme Court of Colorado to ban Donald Trump from the presidential ballot in Colorado on the basis of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which bars anyone from holding federal office if they have betrayed an oath to uphold the Constitution. Today, the Board of Elections in Illinois decided that they don't have the authority to ban Donald Trump from the ballot. They followed the advice of a retired Republican judge on that point. In that judge's report to the Board of Elections, the judge said the evidence presented at the hearing on January 26, 2024, proves by a preponderance of the evidence that President Trump engaged in insurrection within the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. That will be one of the questions that the Supreme Court will have to resolve. Did Donald Trump engage in an insurrection? Another question the Supreme Court will have to resolve is, does Section 3 of the 14th Amendment apply to Donald Trump? The first words of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment say, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office. The question for the Supreme Court is, does the word office apply to the presidency? Is there any reason to think that the office of the, office of the 14th Amendment would not allow a person to become a senator after engaging in insurrection or a member of the House of Representatives or even become an elector of a president, a member of the Electoral College? But did they intend to allow a participant in insurrection to become president? Another question before the Supreme Court will be, is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment what lawyers call self-executing? Congress never passed a law specifying a legal process for excluding someone from office on the basis of Section 3. But Donald Trump's lawyers have argued that it is impossible then to bar him from being on the ballot if he has not, at a minimum, been convicted of the crime of insurrection. Like many cases before the Supreme Court, the answers to the questions before the court lie in history. The Republican majority in the Supreme Court all become amateur historians in cases like this, as do their clerks. They go careening through history with the singular mission of finding ways of supporting conclusions they've already reached. The Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade is one of the low points of Supreme Court historical research. Justice Samuel Alito and his clerks decided to rely on the opinions of two English prosecutors, both of whom, presumably unbeknownst to Justice Alito, were very proud prosecutors of witches and strong advocates of the death penalty for witches 400 years ago, which one of them enforced as a judge. So the most important Supreme Court opinion of the 21st century relies on the thinking of two Englishmen who 400 years ago believed in and prosecuted witches urging that they be put to death. That's how bad the Supreme Court can be in its use and abuse of history. The ahistorical Alito side of the Supreme Court is facing a higher authority this time 
on history. This week, the Supreme Court received a brief in the, ca in the case from America's highest authorities on the history of the 14th Amendment. Jill Lepore, professor of history at Harvard University, David Blight, professor of history and African American studies at Yale University, Drew Gilpin Faust, a historian and former president of Harvard University, who is now a Harvard University professor, and John Fabian Witt, professor of law at Yale Law School. If I can recommend one Supreme Court brief for you to read in your life, let it be this one, because it is relatively short at 34 pages with plenty of white space. It is clearly written, as clearly written as a Supreme Court brief can possibly be, because it doesn't rely on the technicalities of law. The four professors who contributed to this brief are all authors of beautifully written books, easy to read books. This is the kind of brief that high school students could easily read have no challenges reading this. You have, if you have a junior high school student at home who hopes to maybe go to law school someday, or just as a bright junior high school student, this is great reading, great reading for those students. They will have no challenges comprehending any of this. This brief sets out to convince the Supreme Court of this proposition on page four. Its framers intended Section 3, one, to automatically disqualify insurrectionists, two, to apply not only to the Civil War but also to future insurrections, and three, to bar anyone who has betrayed an oath to uphold the Constitution from becoming President of the United States. As to Section 3 applying to future insurrections, the answer to that is on page 3 of the brief, quoting Senator Benjamin Butler in the debate on the 14th Amendment saying, this is to go into our Constitution and to stand to govern future insurrection as well as the present. The brief tells the story of how the 14th Amendment prevented Jefferson Davis, the President of the Confederate States of America, from even attempting to run for the Senate or run for the presidency of the United States after the Civil War. The brief tells the story of members of the Confederacy who were barred from holding federal office automatically and without trial. Quote, when the Democrat Alexander H. Stevens, the former vice president of the Confederacy, was elected to the U.S. Senate, the clerk of Congress refused to call the names of the ex-Confederates at roll, and they were never seated. Simple as that. Before drafting the 14th Amendment, a special joint committee of Congress heard testimony from 145 witnesses. The brief, the historian's brief, prevent, presents the testimony of J.W. Alvord, who was questions about the conditions he found in the southern states. Question, now state what among the rebel people is the general feeling towards the government of the United States? Answer, it is hostile, as it seems to me in the great majority of the southern people I mean, that part of them who were engaged in the rebellion. There is evidently no regret for the rebellion, but rather a defense of it. Question, what great object do they seem to contemplate in their being readmitted to Congress by their senators and representatives? Answer, they seem to suppose that by readmission, they can get political power and obtain again the supremacy which they once had. And with the exception of slavery, they expect to be still a prosperous and dominant portion of our government. Slavery, they have given up in the old form, but they want to subdue and keep in a low place the Negroes by some compulsion, which it seems to me they are trying to affect not only privately, but by all the legislation that I learned of or witnessed. A tax commissioner was asked if they could have their way would the rebel people generally remain in the Union? The, the tax commissioner answered, no. I think they have a stronger aversion and dislike of the Union than when they seceded. That is what the 14th Amendment was aimed against, the Southern insurrectionist spirit that was still strong. John Bingham, a member of the Joint Committee, said, unless you put them in terror of your laws, made efficient by the solemn act of the whole people to punish the violators of oaths. They may defy 
your restrictive legislative power when reconstructed. John Bingham wanted to invoke the terror of our laws to punish the violators of oaths. The historian's brief says, Bingham and his colleagues did not intend it as a political measure to fit their historical moment alone. This legislation will be felt, he said, by generations of men. Thousands of members of the Confederacy believed that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment applied to them and was self-executing, and they proved that belief by sending petitions to Congress asking for the ban against them holding office to be lifted by a two-thirds vote of Congress. The historian's brief says, by 1872, Congress estimated the number of petitioners at 15 or 16,000. The newspapers at the time were full of articles expressing gratitude for Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, preventing Jefferson Davis from ever becoming president of the United States. The historian's final line of their brief says that the authors of the 14th Amendment knew that no one in the United States is above the law, not even the president, and that no Republican government can afford to return insurrectionists to office. Thank you, apparently, for bringing Donald Trump along as a viewer, because he's tracking, I guess, everything you say on TV. Uh, there you were uh, on CBS uh, on Sunday morning, and Donald Trump wrote this about that. He's on his uh, Truth Social thing. He said, I had the great privilege of watching Sean Fain, the president of the United Auto Workers this morning on Deface the Nation. He is a real stiff Stiff is in capital letters, so I guess he really means it. Who is selling the automobile industry <laughs> right into the big, powerful hands of China? Uh, I assume you have no response to that. Uh, look, this is just Donald Trump and who Donald Trump is. Um, he always resorts to name calling because at the end of the day, he doesn't want people to focus on facts, you know. During his presidency, we learned a new phrase. It was called alternative facts, which what we all call lies. But that's the world he operates under uh, because he doesn't want people to see the reality of where he really stands. He serves the billionaire class, the corporate class. And so, you know, uh, he doesn't want us to focus on facts, just as we did in our contract campaign with the big three. You know, we, we put the facts out there. That's why 75 percent of America, uh, you know, sided with us in that fight because those are the issues that matter to Americans, to the majority of Americans. You know, it's better pay, better wages, you know, health care security, uh, retirement security, and just getting our time back, getting our lives back, not having to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day, or multiple jobs just to scrape to get by. That's the economy Donald Trump dreams of. Let me read you what, what Donald Trump said about you today, and this is a clear effort to undermine your relationship to the membership of your union. It's a clear effort by Donald Trump to get the votes yeah. uh, from members of your union by speaking to them this way. He says, Sean Fain, this is today, Sean Fain is a weapon of mass destruction on auto workers in the automobile manufacturing industry in the United States. Is he under contract to China? Now, that that is aimed directly at your membership to try to get their votes and to try to eventually get them to vote against you as their union president. Yeah, look, you know, the only weapon of mass destruction against the automobile industry in America and all industry in America is two words, corporate greed. And that's what Donald Trump's all about. I mean, this is the oldest tactic in the book. It's divide and conquer. This is what the billionaire class and the wealthy do masterfully. They want to divide the masses over race or what color your skin is, gender, you know, who somebody loves, or even border security. We, we hear a lot about that recently. You know, they want to, they want to put a... They, they want to put a villain out there. They want to create whatever boogeyman they can, to, you know, to make us fear uh, somebody else, like they're going to take something or they're a threat to our being. They're not. The only threat to our being is what we've witnessed the last 40 years of our lives, where the rich gets richer, the poor get poorer, the working class continues to struggle to get by. That's the economy they love. You know, this is about humanity. And, and the sad reality is the world Donald Trump wants they want to talk about competition. They want us to compete with, with countries that pay poverty wages 
And basically, they want a society of slavery. That's their ultimate goal. And uh, we're not going to stand for that. So we're not going to let, you know, our membership's smarter than that. They think working class people are stupid. They're not. Working class people get it. And when you put the facts in front of them, the facts are very clear about which candidate looks, looks out for working class people and stands with workers and which candidate has spent a lifetime serving himself. And that's Donald Trump. Are the facts enough, uh, Sean, among the Trump voters who you know and, and I know you talk to? I mean, I know Trump voters. I haven't found that the facts are very persuasive to them. Well, I mean, you know, Trump lives in an alternate reality. I mean, let's be real. I mean, he uh, uh, he's devoid of fact because fact doesn't feed the narrative that he wants people to believe in. But I do believe, you know, when you look at our contract campaign, you look at our strike with the big three, there's a reason why 75 percent of American public sided with us in that fight. And those are the issues people care about. You know, people want their lives back. And so, you know, they want a decent wage, you know, and they want to be able to, to have a job where and have a secure retirement where they can someday have it, have an end and, and actually enjoy their life. Our lives shouldn't revolve around work. And that's the society we live in in this country now. Every every minute of our day is, is, is structured around work. You know, both parents have to work in a two family home or one, you know, if it's one parent, they're, they're working multiple jobs and, and that's not a life. And so I do believe when you look at the facts and look at the reality of where both candidates stand, that will resonate with people. But we have to talk about it. We have to keep the dialogue out there. Uh, Joe Biden has announced the campaign's announced he's coming to Michigan on Thursday. Uh, he's going to celebrate and emphasize that UAW endorsement. Uh, is the UAW endorsement in a state where the election could be very close, uh, possibly a decisive factor? Oh, sure, I believe it is. And, I, you know, again, I believe our members uh, will be overwhelmingly behind him. Um, look, you know, everything's not always perfect. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you look at the record of both of these of these candidates, uh, it's, it's very clear. I mean, Joe Biden stood, you know, the first time in our history and the first time in this nation's history, a sitting U.S. president joined striking workers on a picket line. Uh, Donald Trump had the same opportunity in 2019 when GM was on strike for 40 days and he was president. What did he do? What did he say? Nothing. You know, President Biden worked with us, you know, with to save a community in Belvedere, Illinois. It was written off for dead. A plant was going to close. You know, he, their, their administration worked with us. We were able to get not just that plant saved, but get a second plant, uh, a commitment for a second plant there. You know, Donald Trump, when he was president in 2019, faced the same situation in Lordstown, Ohio. And he did nothing. And he told those those workers, don't sell your houses. And he did nothing but blame the local president at the time. You know, we go you go back into bankruptcy and back in the recession in 2008 and 9. Joe Biden stood with the American worker and worked for a path forward for us. You know, Donald Trump said, let him fail. And he blamed the workers, you know. So there's there's two very distinct people in this fight. You know, Joe Biden has a history. He bet on the American worker. Donald Trump blamed the American worker. And, and that's a very clear choice to me in where working class people should stand in this election. President Sean Fain of the United Auto Workers, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.